So tell me, have you tried any new fruits or vegetables recently? Yes, I, I tried cucumbers, carrots, salad with everything in it. I even tried broccoli with mm, ranch. That and sounds then, good. What did you think about those foods? It just tasted good and I'm going to eat for dinner today. I like all of it. My mom heated all of it up and I tried it and I liked it with salt. And then she made it with salad and cheese. I liked it. Uh huh. Then... So you tried it different ways, and you found some ways that you liked it better. Mm hmm. That's awesome. Hello, and welcome to episode 18 of the Eat Your Greens with Dr. Black podcast, where we discuss plant based nutrition for the whole family. I'm Dr. Angela Black. I'm a board-certified pediatrician. I've been in practice for about 20 years, and I started this podcast to be able to reach more people and to help turn the tide of chronic disease in my patients. And hopefully, even if I help one person to live a healthier life and add a few more healthy foods into their diet, then I will consider this podcast a success. So thank you to all of my returning listeners. Your support means so much to me. Welcome to any new listeners. I've been doing this for about six months now, and I'm getting some positive feedback, which I really appreciate. But let me tell you, what I would really like from you, honestly, is some constructive criticism. I'm just getting started in this whole podcast adventure and developing my style, developing the show, and I want to know how to make it better. So if you have any suggestions for me, if you're a returning listener and you think, gosh, you know, I'd just really like to hear about a certain topic that I haven't talked about yet, or you have some questions or you think, you know, I like your show, but when you do this thing, it's really kind of annoying. Please stop doing that. I want to hear it. So go to the show website. That's www.eatgreenswithdrblack forward slash about. That's where you're going to find my contact form. You can send me a message. You can also email me at dr.black at eatgreenswithdrblack.com. And now I use Buzzsprout as my host, and they have this new feature for texting. So if you're on the website right below the episode player, you're going to see more info. Click on that, and it's going to give you a little place that you can click and send me a text. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any of the other podcast apps, you'll see a little clickable link to text Dr. Black. So if you have suggestions, comments, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. So this episode that you're about to listen to really was, was created to answer some common questions that I'm getting. People would come to me and say, hey, I really like the information you're presenting. I understand that you know, my diet could be better, but I need some tips. I don't know where to start. How do I start eating a healthier diet? How do I get my kids to eat a healthier diet? I just, I don't know where to start. So if this describes you, you've come to the right place. If you're the type of person who previously thought that going plant-based meant adding a side of fries to your burger, then this is the episode for you. This is the first of a three-part series that's specifically geared towards answering some of these questions that I'm hearing about a plant-based diet. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Miller, my colleague, and you may remember her from the very first episode. She graciously agreed to talk to me about her journey as a pediatrician and some of the concerns that she and I share, along with Dr. Hartman, about the health of our patients and why this whole podcast came about to begin with. Dr. Miller's daughter, Mia, decided to adopt a plant-based diet, and Dr. Miller and her family wanted to support Mia but they didn't know how. So we're gonna talk about that today. We are going to share some practical tips for a successful transition over to a plant-based lifestyle without leaving you feeling overwhelmed or deprived. Now, if you like what you hear today, go ahead and please do me a favor, rate it and leave a review on the app that you use to listen. Also, you can go to my website, scroll to the bottom of any page, and subscribe. And when you subscribe, here's what you're going to get. I've created a free guide specifically based on the information in this episode. All of the tips that Dr. Miller and I discussed today about how to move away from your old dietary habits and embrace a healthy plant-centric lifestyle are included in this free guide. So if you find this episode informative or helpful in any way, Go ahead and subscribe. 
you'll get all of this information in a nice, easy to read format, just to help remind you as you start implementing your own healthy habits. Dr. Miller, it's so great to have you back. Thanks for joining me again today. Thank you for having me back again. So tell me just a little bit about your plant-based eating experience so far. What has your family been doing and what kind of changes have you made? Well, Dr. Black, I really wish I could give you a rundown of wonderful changes we've made so far, but I'm afraid that your mentioning of adding a side of fries to our burgers may be more in line with what we've done so far. (laughs) We have definitely aimed to increase our vegetables, but that usually involves pretty limited selections from the grocery store that we repeat over and over again. Uh, And then we've added tofu to a couple of things, but not in very appetizing ways. So I am excited to share this conversation with you today. I'm excited too. At the end of the episode, we are going to go into a little bit of detail about how to prepare tofu, because I think that's a big question a lot of people have. They may have not even ever tried it before and really don't know what to do with it. So we're going to talk about some tips to make the perfect tofu. That sounds wonderful. Well, it's really great that you're supporting Mia in her plant-based eating journey. One of the best ways to be successful when making any kind of habit change but in particular, changing your diet is to get your family and friends on your team. I mean, you really need to cultivate a support network. So kudos to you and your family for supporting Mia. Aside from that, are there any other factors that might motivate you and your family to start making some changes? I think that Mia has had a whole lot to do with it. Uh, She has really tried to educate us on Um, the health benefits to us personally. And also she's very concerned about the impact of eating meat on the planet. As you know, Mia is pretty relentless when she's passionate about something. So it's not something that we can listen to and then ignore. We have, I think, just by being around her, become invested in these goals. That's terrific. In the next episode, my sister is joining me, and we're going to sample a variety of alternative meats like Beyond, Impossible, things like that. Her goal when making changes to her diet is her health. She has rheumatoid arthritis, and plant-based diets have been shown to help with the pain and the inflammation of RA. So she's going to be joining me for the next ep- the next episode where we do a big taste testing. It's going to be a lot of fun. That sounds wonderful. And I think I'd be very interested in that as well, especially because Mia's twin is very much invested in eating meat, is afraid of some substitutes. But I think if we had some great recipes where he could try them in a scenario where he felt familiar, that we'd have a lot more success. So speaking of Mia's twin brother, has it been a difficult transition for him? How have you helped him stay positive or accept the changes that you're making? Well, the few plant-based substitutions that we've tried so far have gone over really well. What's funny is we will sometimes make them for the entire family, but not announce that it's plant-based. This is to make Marcus feel more comfortable in trying them. But as a result, he has become a little bit more suspicious. Does he get upset that he feels like he's missing out on his favorite foods when you do plant-based? No, I think he actually, deep down inside, is excited to try it. He hasn't fully embraced it, but he likes to guess whether it's meat or not. And I think now that he is having so much trouble telling the difference, it actually has opened a door for us to explore some of these substitutions that he might be willing to try. Good for him. I'm glad to hear it. When it comes to making changes, I I always recommend that people have a little bit of self-understanding about maybe what works best for them. For a lot of people, it's small changes that they build on gradually. And I, in fact, that's the most common way that people are successful. But there are people out there who are more like go big or go home. They need to make big changes and stick to them. What do you think your family's style is? You may remember that the people in my family are all completely different from each other. So two of us are go big or go home, and two of us are definitely more into the gradual changes. So I think we'll need to be exposed to a variety of approaches. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out what works best for you. Anybody that's listened to any of my past episodes 
knows that I'm a big planner. I always like to make my menu for the week in advance. Then I have my grocery list. I can make sure I have everything on hand to make my meals stocked in the pantry. So I really think that's a big, that's a really crucial tip is do your research. You know, you know, you want to make some health changes. What are you going to start with? Get the family involved. Pick some recipes that you want to try and make your grocery list. Go to the store. Have everything prepped in advance. And that way you don't have to think about it too much in the middle of the busy work week when you get home and you're tired and you're trying to figure out. Because I know if you're like me, it's going to be straight to the junk food every time. You are absolutely right about that. And I'm happy to say we we picked up a few magazines that had recipes. We did make a grocery list. We haven't quite made it to the point of executing yet, but baby steps. One of the things in the office that I get a lot are, you know, parents who talk about their kids are picky. They only like a few certain things and they get upset when they try to offer different things or they worry that they can never have their favorites again. And, you know, I I do try to tell them it's all about moderation and save those things that they really like for a special occasion. It's not about all or none or never. But I think trying to have a more positive attitude about making health changes where you really think about what's being added instead of what's being taken away is a crucial key to being successful. I mean, there are so many amazing recipes, flavors, textures out there in the world to try. And when you have a really narrow range of foods that you eat, really you're missing out. So I get very excited about some of the recipes that I'm making than all the different abundance of flavors that you can add in. It's So having a positive attitude, I think, is really important. I agree with you. And I think in terms of our family, really emphasizing that we're expanding our options instead of taking away things that we love has been important. And I think also maybe meeting family members where they are with things is helpful. So whereas Mia's twin really enjoys chemistry and loves to cook, if he can start off having some of the things that he traditionally eats and then add some more plants to that, I think he enjoys that a lot. And that is the simplest way to start is take what you already love, maybe reduce the portion size of the animal-based product, and then add in more plant-based options. So you may have your favorite chicken breast that you like, but just have half of the serving and then add in an extra vegetable or two or a salad or a fruit salad on the side for dessert and really bulk it up with the plant-based options. And that's one way to really make healthier choices without feeling like you're losing out on your favorite dishes. You know, it's funny that you say that because I think subconsciously I did that last week. I made a meal that did involve some meat, but I didn't make very much of the meat. And I offered many more types of plants on the side, and I made them in a way that I knew the kids would love. And um, as it turned out, the plants were the star of the show. And I don't even think people really realized that they were getting less of what they thought they couldn't do without. Also, it's a good way to save on your grocery bill, right? Because the meat is getting so expensive. That was one of my motivating factors. Are your kids competitive at all? One of the techniques that I find fun is to kind of gamify it. So you can make a competition, like who can find the best recipe on the internet or who can add the most colors to their plate, maybe have a competition to see who can eat the highest number of different plant-based foods, you know, how many vegetables, how many different fruits, different grains, beans. And, you know, at the end of the week, whoever gets the highest number, well, first of all, they win, so they get bragging rights, but, you know, maybe some prize. Uh, At Christmas, what our family did, it was Christmas Eve. My nephew likes to cook, and he he came over. We had a stir-fry off. So he did a beef and broccoli, and I did a vegan vegetable stir fry. And then we got to all eat and compare, see who the winner was. I think they called it a tie, but it was fun. And I hope that we have that as a new tradition, you know, having a different cook-off every year at the holidays. I love that tradition. And yes, they are definitely competitive. So that would work. One thing that we have done is go to the grocery store together and try to figure out who can find the newest or strangest new plant to try and then figure out 
by using the internet, how to prepare it. And we've had some success and we've had some scary failures that we have to adjust to try again, but that's part of the fun of it. Right. Sometimes failing is just as much fun. Now, if you're a a person who likes to do gradual change, one of the things I recommend is to pick either a day, like a meatless Monday, or even just a meal and make it your meatless meal, your vegan meal. When I was first starting out, I decided that I was all of my lunches at work were going to be vegetarian. I wasn't going to get any chicken or fish, cheese, dairy, things like that. So I committed just to my weekday lunches, and then I built on that from there. So that's a nice gradual technique to help you transition. Just start small and build on it. That actually feels really doable. Another technique would just be to modify recipes that you already know you like. So if you have a family favorite recipe that has beef in it or chicken, you might go to the internet and find a similar recipe that's a vegan alternative. One of the most common examples is to omit the ground beef from spaghetti sauce and add lentils instead. They're really fast and easy to cook. They give you a nice amount of protein and they have kind of a meaty texture. So that's a really one really great way that you can do it. You know, we love spaghetti and I do make a meat sauce with ground beef, but I think lentils, especially in the sauce, would offer a lighter option that makes you feel better after you've eaten it. And I think that flavor and texture wise, it would work. Of course, around here, people eat a lot of tacos and burritos. And one of the most obvious things you can do is to swap out the beef for beans. I, of course, I'm going back to tofu. I love tofu. So you can also swap out tofu for things like chicken in a stir fry. But keep it simple. You know, don't try to start with some elaborate recipe that requires a long list of ingredients that you're unfamiliar with, because that's just going to cost a lot of money and you may not know what you're doing. So, you know, keep it simple. Pick a couple of recipes that you really like to convert and build from there. I will say I did make that mistake. I got excited when I looked in that magazine with recipes and I did buy a long list of ingredients that I was completely unfamiliar with and that cost me a lot of money. They are now in my kitchen. On the same note, now that I have spent the money on them and they are in my kitchen, I'm determined to figure out recipes where I can use them. And fortunately, for a lot of the recipes I've found, they tend to be featured quite a bit. So I'm excited to figure out how to make the best use of them. I always say build your spice rack slowly because a lot of the vegetarian dishes may have flavor profiles from, say, India or other parts of Asia, the Middle East. And there's some really great flavors to be had, but you can spend a ton of money on spices. And so just, again, go slow, pick a few at a time and build up your spice rack. And then once you're more comfortable, you're ready to go with tons of flavor. You'll be blown away by how much flavor. And also, did you know spices are one of the best sources of anti-inflammatory agents? A little goes a long way and they are crazy healthy for you. I think I did know that somewhere in the back of my mind. Another benefit of switching over to more plant-based eating is that you can really cut back on your saturated fat. So another easy flip would be to use a plant-based oil instead of, say, butter or, you know, people sometimes still use lard when they're cooking. So maybe saute your vegetables in olive oil instead of butter, and that's going to take out that unhealthy pro-inflammatory animal fat and make your dish a lot healthier. It has a nice flavor, too. Yeah, I love extra virgin olive oil. It's my ma- the main oil that I use for sure. Another thing is recipes that call for cream or yogurt to make a sauce, to make a cream sauce. You can easily swap out a plant-based milk. I like an unsweetened almond milk or sometimes soy milk instead of regular cow's milk. And after we're done recording, we're going to have a Mediterranean quinoa grain bowl. And the dressing is a Greek dressing that uses a cashew cream. So you buy raw cashews, you soak them in some hot water, and then you blend them in the blender with the other um, ingredients in the salad dressing. And I tasted it. I, this was the first time I'd made it. I taste, I sampled it before. And 
it was delicious. So you can really make some nice salad dressings and cream sauces using things like cashews or plant-based milk. And they're so creamy and delicious and surprisingly easy to make. That sounds amazing. And it also sounds like I wouldn't miss out on anything. I'm going to put the recipe to that salad dressing in the show notes for everybody. What about snacks? Have Has it been a challenge for y'all to find healthier snacks? I mean, this may not be switching from animal products to plant-based products, but we're, another important thing to do is to switch from processed food to more whole food. And the snacks are the thing that are really going to get you with that. What sorts of things have you tried for choosing healthier snacks? Well, we you know, we do better with our snacks, I think, than we do with our main meals. Um, We do have a lot of fruit, and I find that my family tends to consume it more if I pre-cut it for them. And that sounds a little bit silly, but if there's a whole apple out, uh, they may bypass it for something that's less healthy. But if it's sliced, it for some reason entices them. So having a wide variety of fruits that are easy to consume and feel snacky seems to work well for us. So just take the work out of it, make it easy for them. Yes, and they they like different textures. So we do things like use the air fryer to add some texture to things. So they love broccoli, for example, that's in the air fryer. They love edamame in the air fryer. Vegetables that they may not enjoy as much raw, they will eat like chips in the air fryer, kale even. Well, one of the toppings on our grain bowl that I made is a chickpea snack. And so all you do is take canned chickpeas, toss them with some olive oil and your favorite spices, and I put them in the air fryer until they're nice and crispy. And so they're great for just snacking on, for topping salads. For us, they're going on our our grain bowl. Now, when you're committing to making a change, one of the things I do recommend is to just start by cleaning out your fridge and your pantry. Get rid of the unhealthy things that you are trying to eliminate from your diet right off the bat so that they're not just there tempting you. You can donate anything that's not perishable and isn't expired to your local food bank. An alternative would be to pick a date that you're going to start and stop buying those old products in advance. So then they're not there, you know, making you feel bad about throwing them all out. I like that running start idea. So the last strategy that I find helpful, instead of starting with a day or a meal, is to pick a category that you want to cut out and go from there. So it might be, say, red meat. You're going to stop stop cooking any kind of red meat. And then once you're used to making things without that, then you move to the next category. Maybe it's pork or chicken. You know, you just go one at a time. And that way, you're doing a stepwise process that may feel easier than trying to cut out all animal products all at once. I think that approach might work for our family as well, especially because we have some of our favorites that may be more difficult to phase out. If we start with the ones that are less popular, then that kind of gives us some practice and makes us feel like we're not missing out on anything. And you can save your favorites for special occasions like turkey on Thanksgiving or something like that. For me, I really like creme brulee and I am committed on my birthday Every year, I'm going to have my creme brulee. I think I'm going to need you to help me find a good substitute for that creme brulee. Can we do that with cashews? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. I never looked. I bet we can. That might be a little beyond my personal kitchen skills. (laughs) Now, on the other end, people who have made attempts to go plant-based sometimes say that they stopped because they ended up feeling hungry all of the time. But often they did it as part of their weight loss strategy or they didn't really explore a lot of hearty foods and they ended up eating a lot of salad and and fruit that really didn't have enough calories, right? So be sure when you're trying to commit to making a change for the better in terms of your health and your diet, don't sacrifice calories. Make sure that you come away from your meals feeling satisfied The way to do this would be to include all three of your macros, right? Macros are fat, carbohydrate, and protein. So you want to make sure that your meals really have all three. They have a good amount of calories so that you come away from the table feeling satisfied, and you'll be much less likely to 
say, give in to cravings later and go out for that cheeseburger because you were just starving from your, you know, little small fruit smoothie that you had in the morning. Once again, I think you have just described a common scenario in our household. We often do become concerned that we're going to be hungry quickly. And I know that dad is always worried that he's not going to get enough protein. So I think being able to explore what good sources of those macros are would be helpful. Well, one thing that you can do is nuts. You can add nuts. So in my morning smoothie, I now add a small handful of walnuts and even a slice or two of avocado. So that's going to add healthy plant-based oils. And then the nuts really boost the protein in the smoothie. And I find that I'm satisfied until lunchtime, whereas before I might have been hungry around 1030 in the morning if I didn't add those things in. That makes sense. Another benefit to adding healthy fats to a relatively high carb meal is that it evens out your blood sugar curve. So you're less likely to have that big spike in blood sugar that then crashes, leaving you feeling hungry. And it's also much healthier in terms of lowering your diabetes risk. So a lot of people think that to be healthy, they need to be on a low fat diet. But I say you really need to be on a healthy fat diet. Don't cut them out. Add some in. Now, a little goes a long way, so you don't want to overdo it, right? That makes sense. And it's not too hard to implement that. So last, let's just talk a little bit more about tofu, because I know a lot of people just get glassy eyed when I start mentioning tofu. They have no idea what it is, what to do with it. When you've tried tofu at home, what have you done? What recipes have you added it to? Well, I'm fairly limited in my in my knowledge about tofu, but I have discovered that it's incredibly versatile. So we have made kind of a chicken fried tofu that everyone seems to really love. We've also tried just putting it in certain recipes to substitute chicken mainly because we find that the texture seems to translate very easily and it takes on the flavor of the things around it. So it's not very obtrusive. It has a a nice texture. It leaves you feeling lighter. And a lot of times the unaware, the people who are unaware are not resistant to trying it. I compare it a lot to potatoes and rice. It has such a bland flavor and it takes on the flavor of the sauce that you use. I think that's one of its main positive attributes. So for people who don't know, tofu comes in a variety of different levels of firmness. So you have silken tofu. That's going to be the mushiest, creamiest. You can blend it and make salad dressing. You can use it as a replacement for ricotta cheese in something like lasagna. And more recently, I haven't tried it yet, but more you can use it to make chocolate pudding. I was just going to say that I have a friend who made a mousse, a chocolate mousse from it. He did it as part of a challenge to a very meat-based relative that came over and swore they would never try tofu. And so as part of the challenge, he made a traditional mousse, and then he made a tofu mousse. And you can guess by my story which one won him over. That's great. So I'm, it's on my list to try. So then as you move along, there's silken, and then there's a medium firm tofu. I haven't really used that much. And then you have firm and extra firm. Extra firm is the one I use the most often because when you cook it, it's going to give you a meatier texture. But here's the secret. It comes packaged with water, and you really want to get the water out. The recipe will say, wrap it in a paper towel and lightly press the water out of it for 15 minutes. So don't believe the recipe. Here's what you do. I wrap it in a kitchen towel, and then I put several heavy things on it, like the cast iron skillet, and I leave it there for a minimum of an hour, sometimes three or four hours. So you really want to get as much of the water as possible out of it. So any recipe that starts out saying, press it for 15 minutes with a paper towel, just ignore that part. I must admit, I've never pressed my tofu. I didn't know that I was supposed to do that. And now that I think about it, I think that would really improve the outcomes. Yeah, it just it's a little too mushy if you don't get the water out. I've read some other techniques. Some people say freezing it first, and I've even seen one food blogger recommend boiling it, which I'm not sure how boiling it gets the water out, but they swore by that technique. But I'm sticking with my wrapping it in the kitchen towel for a few hours, and then you cut it into cubes. Hey, it's me. 
I'm just jumping in here, interrupting my conversation with Dr. Miller to tell you about boiling tofu. At the time that Dr. Miller and I had our conversation, I had only briefly heard about this technique of boiling tofu. I thought it sounded really weird, but I decided to give it a try. And I'll tell you what, I am converted. All you do is take your tofu out of the fridge, cut it into whatever size piece that you want, and then put it in some water and boil it at just a low boil. You don't want to boil it too vigorously because it can break apart the tofu, but keep it at a low boil for about 10 minutes and then drain off the water, let it cool for a minute. And then all I had to do was gently press it between a couple of kitchen towels just to get the remaining moisture out. It gives the best, chewiest texture of the tofu that I've had, and I am not going back to just pressing. It saves me time, and I really enjoy how the tofu turns out. So here's here's something I'm considering that I just want to run by you, and I invite you to uh, reach out to me and tell me your opinion on this. Some of these things that I talk about, like how to prepare tofu, I feel like would do well on a short video. Now, I am not a food blogger. I have no interest whatsoever in developing recipes or becoming a YouTuber, and I really have no time to do major video edits. So I'm tossing around the idea, though, what if I did some short videos on things like this, like how to boil and press your tofu, something like that, that would lend itself to a really short video that I might do, you know, just periodically, probably not regularly. If you have an opinion on this, please let me know. Like I said at the top of the episode, you can go to my website on the about page or the contact page. You can email me. All of those links are in the show notes. And there's also this new feature from Buzzsprout where you can even send me a text. Now, I cannot reply to that text, but I would get your information and use it uh, as I consider how to further develop my show. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Dr. Miller. The easiest thing to do with it is to put the cubes in a bowl, sprinkle it with some cornstarch and toss it to coat, and then you just pan fry it. Just get a skillet with a little bit of olive oil, maybe a little sesame oil if you're doing an Asian flavored dish, and just pan fry it like just like you would brown chicken, right? You're going to let it brown, flip it, let the other side brown, and then you get this nice crispy outside and a nice soft inside. Although you could do the exact same thing and just put it in the air fryer or even bake it in the oven. You put it at 400 degrees and bake it until it's all crispy on the outside. And so then you get a nice texture, super easy. And then you just toss whatever stir fry sauce or other sauce that your recipe calls for with it. And you have a nice, flavorful, meaty textured tofu in your dish. Okay, I'm a huge fan of five ingredients, simple recipes, and you've just given me three with ingredients that I actually have now in my kitchen. Perfect. You'll have to let me know how your next tofu adventure turns out. Well, I've got three things to try, so we might have to do it three ways. Well, I'm excited to hear more about how your family does transitioning over to a more of a healthy plant-based way of eating. So keep me posted. And I really appreciate you joining me today to share your experience. Well, I'm looking forward to your next couple of podcasts to get additional ideas of how to really do this. Thank you for having me. To sum up, there are a few key elements to ensure that your transition to a plant-based lifestyle is successful. Start by making gradual changes. Whenever possible, involve the whole family and look for creative ways to incorporate more whole plant foods into your favorite meals. It's important to cultivate a supportive network and to approach the process with a positive attitude. Stay focused on all the delicious new foods you're adding rather than what you're removing. Strategies like gamifying the process, modifying favorite recipes, and experimenting with new ingredients can make the journey enjoyable and sustainable. Don't forget to include all three macros, fat, carbohydrate, and protein to avoid hunger and reduce cravings. By focusing on whole foods, exploring new flavors, and finding fun ways to involve the family, transitioning to a plant-based diet can be a rewarding and delicious experience. 
Hey, before you go, do me a favor. If you enjoyed this episode and found the information helpful, please take a couple of seconds to share it with a friend. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to eat your greens. be aware that this podcast provides general health information about nutrition and feeding of infants and children and is meant for educational purposes only. It's not intended to replace the important relationship between a parent, child, and pediatrician. If you have concerns about your child's nutrition, health, or growth, please consult your doctor.